Good morning, everyone. Sorry about that kind of hard abrupt on the ending of that verse. <clears throat> Make sure I silence my mobile device. Good morning. I trust that you're having a wonderful Sunday morning. The weather seems to be nice outside today. And it's a good day to be able to study the Word of God. This morning, we're going to continue in our study through the Minor Prophets. We are picking up in Hosea chapter 9. So if you haven't done so already, be sure to open your Bibles to Hosea chapter 9. Make one minor adjustment here. Okay. All righty, Hosea chapter 9. We are continuing in this study. And someone says, why are you studying the Old Testament? Why study the Minor Prophets? Well, there are a lot of valuable lessons to be learned from the Old Testament. And in this particular section of our study, one of the primary lessons we seem to be learning in this is God's view regarding obedience and disobedience. And this is a pretty simple concept that many people tend to ignore. Um, in this morning's sermon, we're going to be looking at John chapter 15, roughly the first half of that chapter. And what we're going to see in part of that section is the direct connection between love for God and obedience to Him. It's not enough to simply obey God. We have to love Him. And love is going to be the source of our obedience. You may have, like the children of Israel, there were times that they sought the Lord to serve the Lord. And I believe there were times they obeyed Him out of the simple fear of the Lord. When Jehoshaphat brought about a series of reforms. When you look towards the end of his reign, you find that Jehoshaphat was unable to turn their hearts to the Lord. So, yeah, they were doing the right things, and, and he was forcing them to give up idolatry and things of that nature. But ultimately, their heart was not in serving God. And so, when kind of we might want to ask the question, what caused the northern nation of Israel to stray away from God? What caused Jeroboam to uh, bring in idols when the division initially took place? Why didn't he enforce proper obedience to the law of God? And when everything was said and done, the answer was pretty simple. He chose not to do that. He, he desired to have the people with him more than leaving him to return to uh, Jerusalem for worship. And so he did what he wanted to do. He did not have a love for God. He did not obey the commands of the Lord. And so when we look at the sin of Israel here, um, we're going, you know, let me use a little bit different analogy here real quick. Because the Lord refers to their departure as harlotry, if you had an individual whose spouse decided to um, engage in extramarital affairs, the genuine question would should be asked, well, then do you really love me? And oftentimes, you know, the answer would be, yes, I, I do and everything, but and every, all that other stuff. But the point is, oftentimes at that moment when that sin occurs, the love is not genuine, is not like it should be. Same way for the northern nation of Israel. They committed harlotry upon God. They did not love the Lord. And so as a result, they walked away from him. And so when we look here um, at beginning in chapter 9, verse 1, we are stepping into a short little period of time where there seems to be peace having been brought about by a bit of bribery. Let me turn over there real quick, and we're going to be turning to 2 Kings chapter 15, verse 19. And I'll have this on the screen. So just, you can leave your Bibles there, Hosea 9, if you would like. But there in, let's see, let's start there, yeah, verse 19. Notice here, Pul, king of Assyria, came against the land, and Menahem gave Pul a thousand talents of silver, that his hand might be with him to strengthen the kingdom under his control. And Menahem exacted the money from Israel, from all the very wealthy, from each man fifty shekels of silver, to give to the king of Assyria. So the king of Assyria turned back and did not stay there in the land. So this was during the reign of Menahem, one of the, the, the latter kings of the northern nation of Israel. And he basically bribes Pul 
um, or however you would pronounce the simple name of P-U-L, <laughs> king of Assyria, he bribes him with the thousand uh, shekels of silver there to not come against the northern nation of Israel. And Paul accepted the money. So this probably created a momentary time of peace, a momentary time of prosperity, where finally they were able to get back to their life. They didn't have to worry about the Assyrians conquering them. Things were getting better. And apparently the gods were now blessing them. Okay. You can kind of see this mindset coming in. And so what it would cause was basically a premature rejoicing, a premature joy. Hey, we're out of, we're out of the fire, we're out of the woods, and everything is fine now. The gods have blessed us. Well, that's not what had happened at all. As a matter of fact, what we're about to look at is the Lord warns them, you are premature in your rejoicing. And when everything is said and done, there will be judgment as a result of their sin. Now, before we begin with our reading, I invite you, if you have any thoughts or comments, if you'd like to participate in our study today, please feel free to do so. Uh, if you're watching this on our live Facebook stream, you can use the comment area uh, that's connected with this live stream. If you're watching us on our live YouTube channel, then we have a chat area there. Um, or maybe you're watching it on our website, live.seminalpoint.church, or on some streaming device like Roku or Amazon Fire TV, and you still want to participate, you can send us a text message. Send it to 405-276-2966, and we'll bring those thoughts and comments and questions into this morning's study. So let's jump right into our reading here now. <clears throat> Do not rejoice, O Israel, with joy like other peoples, for you have played the harlot against your God. You have made love for hire on every threshing floor. The threshing floor and the wine press shall not feed them, and the new wine shall fail in her. They shall not dwell in the Lord's land, but Ephraim shall return to Egypt and shall eat unclean things in Assyria. They shall not offer wine offerings to the Lord, nor shall they sacri their sacrifices be pleasing to him. It shall be like bread of mourners to them. All who eat it shall be defiled, for their bread shall be for their own life. It shall not come into the house of the Lord. So let's pause here for a moment, and let's kind of give some consideration to what he is saying here in the text. You go back up there to verse 1 there. This is why I said a while ago, this might have been a momentary time of rejoicing. He says there in the text, do not rejoice, O Israel, with joy like other people. You know, you, you may think everything is fine. You may, you may think everything is dandy. But remember, you played the harlot against your God. And one of the ways they did, if you'll notice here, he says, you've made love for hire on every threshing floor. See, in their worship of false gods, um, and, and this very well could be talking about uh, physical adultery, and oftentimes sexual immorality was used in the worship of false gods. Many ungodly things were used in the worship of false gods. We even see that during the New Testament time period. Just, just study history from the time of the Roman Empire as an example, and look at the various um, idols and temples to Diana and Aphrodite and others, you'll oftentimes find a great deal of ungodliness going on in the worship of false gods. And so because they were turning to the false gods, such as Baal, Molech, Chemosh, and others of that nature there, um, or of that design, I guess, they being created by man, the Lord viewed it as them making love for hire on threshing floor, all right? And so we're looking at a, a, a great symbol of harlotry, and this is what they had done, and the Lord was not going to withhold judgment. Now, as a result of this, and notice an interesting connection here when he says, you've made love for hire on every threshing floor, the threshing floor and the wine press. Let's talk about those two things there for just a moment, and then we'll get to our chat room to see what comments we have coming in. We talk about the threshing floor. Um, basically, the threshing floor was the area where they would go when they would separate the uh, chaff from the wheat. And there would be a process there where they would have to be uh, uh, threshing the heads of the grains upon the, the floor. And as they would break apart, the heavier grain itself would fall to the ground. 
but the chaff would blow away. When you uh, look at the history of the nation of Israel, you'll see the idea of the threshing floor being seen quite often. And it, the, re the reason why it's being mentioned here is because it is part of how they would receive their food. I mean, it's, it's an essential element of their survival. Then he talks about there the wine press. Well, the wine press was where they, well, pressed the grapes to produce the grape juice. And and then subsequently the, the wine is, is depending on the, the various usage of the word there. But the wine press is where they would press the fruit and they would get the juice from the fruit. And again, a sign of prosperity when the wine presses were flowing, a threshing floor sign of prosperity when there was a great work uh, being done on the threshing floor. But then notice what he says here, shall not feed them. The threshing floor and the wine press shall not feed them, and the new wine shall fail in her. Not even the new wine would be sufficient to supply the needs of the people there. So he's reminding them that judgment is still going to come and that they are not going, they're not getting away with what they think that they are. All right, we've got a comment coming in from Arthel the third. And see, now, I tested this earlier. <laughs> All right, hang on. I tested it, and it worked, and kind of like someone on Sunday morning going back to get, going back to bed, I guess. Here we go. All right, anyway, here's what Arthel has to say as we bring it back up there. He says, this passage reminds me, here we go, this passage reminds me of how some people think they can buy their way into heaven or think that bribing people with money will ease their problems. Even though Christ has paid our debt for us, it's still up to us whether we accept his offer or reject it. That is true. That is true. Um, whether or not we abide in him is up to us. Um, whether or not we are bearing fruit. And I say all that because of the sermon that we're going to be considering this morning. What is interesting in John chapter 15 is it talks about it is God who will cut off the branches that are fruitless and will prune the branches which bear fruit. And ultimately, whether or not individuals serve God is up to them, and God's the one that then separates there, especially there at judgment. But you're right, some people think they can buy their way into heaven. I was watching a, a brief news clip this morning, and it's not really related to our topic, but uh, your thought brought it to mind there. They were interviewing some religious leader at some church, some, uh, some religious organization, and uh, they were talking about the, uh, him coming out as homosexual, or practicing homosexual, I should say. And they asked the question, you know, why would you choose this lifestyle of uh, working in... Um, an institution that disapproved of uh, engaging in that type of lifestyle and behavior. And um, what he said was, is this is my spiritual home. This is where I was baptized. This is where I first took communion. And, and he's talking about the building itself. And what happens is, and this is much like the children of Israel, they look at the meeting place, they look at the structure as being representation of God, of their service unto God, and, and really the home there. They don't look at the scriptures, they don't understand what the Bible truly teaches about the body of Christ. And so as a result, they begin to do things as they would have to see fit, and they think that all is fine with God. Now, the only reason why I mention that, it kind of touches on what Arthel pointed out there in that they think differently than what God has taught within the scriptures. And they choose that different path, just as Israel did many, many years ago. And let's see, Dan. Dan says, there we go. The way God dealt with his children under the Mosaic law is the way he will deal with his children under the new law. You think about James chapter 1, verse 19. Here's James. Let's bring that up here real quick. James 1, 17. He makes a statement there that every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his cre uh, creatures. Let's see, I might have been one off on that. 
But anyway, I know what Dan is talking about here in the context there. It might actually be chapter two that he's singing about there. Um, that he makes the point that we have to um, look into the perfect law of liberty. We have to make certain that we abide by all that the Lord has taught us to uh, abide by, to, uh, to follow there. And um, let's see. Bear with me. I know, I know what you're talking about, and I want to go ahead and bring it into the text, make sure someone has already done that. There in, um, let's see, back up. Uh, let's see. Here we, no, that's not it. Okay, well, I know, I know what you're talking about there. And I think the idea probably, where is it? Looking to the perfect law of liberty. That's not in chapter two, it's in chapter one. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> there we go. I knew we'd find it at some point. So I'll share it with you. So if we look back up here into verse 20, 22 there, he talks about, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. And what where he goes on in the context here, and this isn't exactly where I wanted to be, what makes the point that if we if if we reject one part of the law, then we become guilty of the whole law. And um, that's exactly what the children of Israel had done. They had rejected the law of God, and so they became guilty of that law. And so if we choose to reject the covenant of Jesus Christ, then we become guilty of the whole covenant of Jesus Christ. Um, the, the guilt of our disobedience is laid bare across our shoulders there. All right. One more comment. Let's see. Angela says... One who is indebted cannot redeem another indebted person. Jesus was the only one who is not indebted and thus could save many. That's exactly right. Jesus was not in bondage to sin. He was free. Therefore, he could pay the price to set us free. Good point. Good point. All righty. Now, let's go ahead and come back in our text there. To Hosea chapter 2. And note with me now in verse Notice he says, They shall not dwell in the Lord's land, but Ephraim shall return to Egypt, shall eat unclean things in Assyria. We talked about this last week in chapter 8. There was a reference to them returning to Egypt. And he's not literally meaning Egypt, although it's possible some fleeing ended up in Egypt. But more the idea of Egypt was a representation of bondage. Going back to the many years ago when they were uh, slaves in the land of Egypt and Moses uh, led them to uh, led them out of that land of bondage there. But he says, But Ephraim shall return to Egypt and shall eat unclean things in Assyria. Again, Ephraim was more of the representation of the whole of the northern nation of Israel and the idea of them going into Assyrian captivity and eating unclean things is very significant. We have this showing a clear separation between them and God, not a partial separation but a clear separation. Um, when the southern nation of Judah would go into the Babylonian captivity, those who were faithful to God still managed to live in accordance to the law as much as they could. I think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as Daniel as well, in uh, being allowed to eat what was proper according to the law and not eat the unclean things of the land. The only thing really they could not do was go and worship God there in the temple because they were, of course, in the land of Babylon. But the fact that he says here, and shall eat unclean things, I think, in Assyria, further suggests and points to their complete and utter separation from God. They would not be able to worship him. They would not be able to do anything to try to make appeasement to him for what they had done. Um, it was a done deal, you might say. Dan was looking at the idea. Dan, I'm sorry about this. My brain was not on the same thing your brain was, and I wish that it had been. Although we read it, Dan's point was, with God, there's no variation or shadow of turning. And that was where we were looking at James 1.17. 
every good gift um, and look at the latter part there with whom there is no variation or shadow of attorney. That's where Dan was sending us to. And that's exactly right. It's exactly right, Dan. I appreciate that. Yep. All right. So let's see real quickly here. Uh, more, like I said, the Lord was not going to accept any offering from them. We see it there in the text. They shall not offer wine offerings to the Lord, nor shall they sac their sacrifices be pleasing to him. It shall be like bread of mourners to them. All who eat it shall be defiled, for the bread shall be their own life, and it shall not come into the house of the Lord. These people would be utterly cut off, utterly cut off from the Lord. Now, think about this for just a moment. The descendants of these people would come to be known as the Samaritans, those people that remained behind and intermarried with other people captured by the Assyrian Empire that would bring into the land and everything. Um, they would later be known as Samaritans, and they still were trying to worship God. Okay, Remember the conversation with the woman at the well in John chapter 4. Um, she asked Jesus quite specifically, um, where was the proper place to worship? You know, she says, we worship on Mount Gerizim, as Moses commanded. You worship in Jerusalem. Well, the reason why is apparently the only law that really stuck with the people that remained behind in their attempts to come back to God was the first five books of the law, at least what Moses had commanded the people. And Moses gave the law long before um, David had taken the city of Jerusalem um, as a city of God and ultimately move the tabernacle there and build a temple there. And so in their mindset, their efforts to try to appease God, they were still holding to some elements of the law of Moses and worshiping there on Mount Gerizim where at one time there had been an, an altar. And Jesus, and, and she says, and you worship in Jerusalem. So the point I'm trying to make here is that the people would try at some point to restore some level of worship of God but it wouldn't be to the acceptable pattern that the Lord would allow. Now, ultimately, their descendants would enter into the kingdom of heaven through obedience to the gospel's call because of the Messiah, because of the death of Jesus on the cross of Calvary. And I think it was chapter 3 of Hosea kind of looked forward to those days. Yeah. All right, so with that being said, they would not be able to worship the Father whatsoever. So now we pick up in verse 5. He says, what will you do in the appointed day and in the day of the feast of the Lord? For indeed, they are gone because of destruction. Egypt shall gather them up. Memphis shall bury them. Nettles shall possess their uh, valuables of silver. Thorns shall be in their tents. The days of punishment have come. The days of recompense have come. Israel knows. The prophet is a fool. The spiritual man is insane because of the greatness of your iniquity and great in a enmity. The watchman of Ephraim is with my God, but the prophet is a fouler snare in all his ways. Enmity in the house of his God. And let's go one more. They are deeply corrupted as in the days of Geba. He will remember their iniquities. He will punish their sins. So let's go ahead and pause there for a moment and then go back into verse number five. If you have any thoughts or comments, we'd love to hear from you. Feel free to use the comment area that's connected with this live video stream on our Facebook page or the chat area connected on our live stream on our YouTube channel or send me a text 2745-276-2966. All right, so let's go ahead and resume there with verse 5. So notice he says, what will you do in the appointed day and in the day of the feast of the Lord? What are you going to be doing at this point in time? That's his question for them. Well, what is his point? Well, let's consider. Let's consider the state of the affairs that they will be having, they will have to deal with. And this is why they will not be able to worship. This is why they're not going to be able to offer any acceptable sacrifices unto the Lord. As he says here, and in the day, he says, what will you do in the appointed day and in the day of the feast of the Lord? He says, for indeed they are gone because of destruction. He's talking about them being carried away, carried away into captivity. And then whatever's left behind, he says, Egypt shall gather them up. Memphis shall bury them. Nettles, I said uh, needles will go probably. Nettles shall possess their valuables of silver and thorns shall be in their tents. We're looking at desolation here. When they're carried off into a captivity, 
Uh, they undoubtedly did not take all their possessions with them. And over the course of time, the, the, the um, foliage that there might have been in the area would have slowly begun to take over their homes, their tents they left behind. The riches and wealth they left behind would have been taken over by the, the same type of foliage in the imagery here. Um, even people coming in from Egypt or Memphis would um, take whatever's been left behind. So it's, it's the idea of desolation, the idea here of um, them being not in this location, but instead being carried away. Let's pause for a moment. We have a comment coming in from Angela. And let me get that passage brought up here real quick. <clears throat> That's an interesting comparison or a cross-reference, if you would. Angela points us over in the direction of Ezekiel chapter 7, verses 1 through 4. So let's take a moment and read this. Again, we're talking about judgment Judgment upon Israel is kind of the idea here with this. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, And you, son of man, thus says the Lord God to the land of Israel, An end, the end has come upon the four corners of the land. Now the end has come upon you, and I will send my anger against you. I will judge you according to your ways, and I will repay you for all your abominations. My eye will not spare you, nor will I have pity. But I will repay your ways, and your abominations will be in your midst. Then you shall know that I am the Lord, the God. Uh, I'm sorry. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Sorry about that. And so it, it is the idea there that judgment was still going to fall, and the end result would be to prove to them that he, of course, is the Lord. Good, good, good comparison there, or cross-reference, kind of looking at the same mindset that we're looking at here within our text. Yeah. All right. Let's look now at verse 7. Any thoughts? Any comments? I'd love to hear from you. Verse 7 says, The days of punishment have come. The days of recompense have come. Israel knows. He says, The prophet is a fool. The spiritual man is insane. Because of the greatness of your iniquity and great enmity. Now, there are a couple of different ways that we could take this particular statement. When he's talking about prophet, let's go ahead and deal with that one first. He could be talking about the actual true prophet sent by God, in this case in point, Hosea as an example of that. But really, if, if we keep it within the context uh, they would no longer be able to worship God um, in, in any form or fashion, whether acceptable or unacceptable. They were going to be carried off into captivity, judgment, days of recompense have come. In that day, he says, the prophet is a fool. The spiritual man is insane because of the greatness of your iniquity and great enmity. If the prophet was to be a true prophet of God, and he's talking about him being a fool, it would have to be because there's nothing more he can do to save the people. All right, there's nothing more whatsoever the people have fallen. If, however, the prophet here is just talking about their standard prophet there, one of the, maybe the prophets of Baal, think about that for a moment with the uh, battle of Mount Carmel with Elisha. It could be here that the king uh, reigning over Israel during the time of their um, captivity and so forth, leading up to that. All of his prophets, the prophets who worshiped false gods, all the spiritual men and all that, none of them would be able to bring a solution to the problem. Uh, whatever the words of the prophet would say, he would be a fool. The spiritual man would go insane because what he thought was going to happen didn't happen. Go back to what we talked about at the start. You know, hey, the gods are blessing us. No, they're not. Everything you think you knew, you did not know is kind of the idea. But he connects it with the prophet is a fool, the spiritual man is insane because of the greatness of your iniquity and great enmity. They had fallen that far from God that anyone of a spiritual nature, you know, whether it's right or wrong before God, uh, would go insane trying to rectify the situation because it could not be fixed. They could not move against Jehovah God, no matter what they believed their false gods would do. Jehovah God truly would bring judgment upon the people there. <clears throat> All righty, let's see. 
Notice with me now in verse 8. Let's see. We've got one comment. I'm going to double check this verse here real quick. Okay, all right. I see. I see what what Diane is saying here. It's in her Bible has a reference regarding verse five. Talked about the feast there, to Leviticus chapter twenty three verse thirty four, and the feast spoken of there says, "Speak to the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of this seventh month shall be the feast of tabernacles for seven days to the Lord." And so her cross-reference there points her to this as an example, maybe of one of the feasts they might have tried to have kept in order to uh, be um, some semblance of right back with God. It, of course, failed them, uh, but that's a good, good point. And that's in reference to, and in the day of the feast of the Lord is what she was talking about there, the cross-reference, Leviticus 23, verse 34. Appreciate that, yeah. Uh, and that was a pretty important feast. It, and see, we must not assume that Jeroboam did not try to take some of the feasts with him. In other words, when the Lord divided the kingdom and Jeroboam, the Lord gave Jeroboam the 10 northern tribes, he probably tried to keep the feast days intact as much as he could um, because it's probably what the people enjoy doing. But he did it on their own terms, at their own high places that he established there, Dan and Bethel, and uh, gave the responsibility to, over to a priesthood not chosen by God. Um, and so that that could be could be what he's referencing there. And in the day of the feast of the Lord, showing that they still might have continued to try to keep those feasts. Interesting, interesting point. All right. So notice here now. In verse 8, let's talk about the watchman here for just a moment. He says, The watchman of Ephraim is with my God, but the prophet is a fowler snare in all his ways. <clears throat> Enmity in the house of his God. A little footnote there to the word watchman. What it does, it gives us a series of cross references, of course, to Ezekiel 3.17 and 33.7. The idea of the watchman watching over the people, watching for danger, watching for harm. Well, here he says, the watchman of Ephraim is with my God, but the prophet is a fowler's snare in all his ways. In other words, the imagery painted here is that the watchman is trying to warn Ephraim of the dangers that are coming. He's warning Ephraim to turn back to God and, and do what was right, but the prophet and this could be the same prophet as earlier that we uh, talked about in regards to their misleading the people and idolatry. He says the prophet is a fowler snare in all his ways. In other words, the watchman is saying, hey, guys, you got to listen up. The end is coming. God's bringing judgment. And the prophet is saying, no, don't listen to him. Don't listen to him at all. He's speaking lies and nonsense. And that's not Hosea, by the way. It's some other prophet that they were turning to. And you'll notice there that the um, Fowler's snare, the little definition there, or um, footnote, one who catches birds in a trap or a snare. Okay, so he's trying to warn them here in the text. The watchman is telling you to listen up, danger's on the way. The prophet is trapping the people by telling them what they want to hear, not what God wants them to hear. And as a result, he says, enmity in the house of his God. Okay. The watchman is warning. The prophet is saying, no, don't worry about it. There's not a problem. And it creates an enmity there within God's people. It's a tragic case in point because it tells us if we, if I understand this right, and my understanding could be off a little bit, of course, but if I understand it right, it is saying much like Hosea, there were some trying to get the people to do what was right. But then there were those who did not. And that's the ones that people chose to listen to. And much the same thing takes place today. Many times it's the wrong people that are given the bullhorn. It's the wrong people who are given the attention. 
and it's the wrong people that gets the platform and, and is able to mislead others in their direction. And this is what we see happening here. There in verse 9, real quick, he says, They are deeply corrupted as in the days of Gibeah. He will remember their iniquity. He will punish their sins. So he's still talking about the prophet here. He's still talking about, let's go a little higher here in the text, that that spiritual man, if you would, um, is insane. He's still talking about those two, especially the prophet there. And about them, he says there that they're deeply corrupted and that he, the Lord, would remember their iniquity and that he would punish, punish, that says, their sins. So what do you think about that? Is this a great lesson for us to learn today? Is this something that we should pay attention to? I would think, of course, the answer is yes. We should pay close attention to this. We have um, pardon me. We have a situation that's developing in a very ungodly world that we live in that is beginning to influence and has always been, but is continuing to be an influence against those who are members of the body of Christ. And so what we have to make certain is that we don't listen to those who would lead us away from the Lord. You know, it's funny to hear the secular world try to help us better understand the Bible. The secular world try to help us to better really understand what God was trying to tell us in Genesis and throughout the whole of the text. But the reality is, if we listen to them, then we will be led astray. And many have been led astray. So it's important to learn from these lessons and to make certain that we do not walk away from the Lord and we do not depart from his service. We've got one more comment I'll bring in. And then uh, we'll plan to pause our study for this morning. It's 938. We'll pick up next week with Hosea chapter 9, verse 10. Um, Hosea chapter 9, verse 10. You know, it's interesting. If you get a chance to read through this, we won't we won't talk about this much in the sermon this morning, but John 15, we'll talk about how Jesus is the vine and we are the branches and we're supposed to be bearing fruit. And we're going to take a moment to show how the children of Israel was considered a, a vine of God, but yet ended up bearing wild fruit. And from what we'll see there in verse 10, he says, I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your fathers as the first fruits on the fig tree in its first season. And uh, so we'll continue with that. And um, what the Lord did find did not remain because they, of course, departed from him. Hosea 9, verse 10. A couple of comments here real quick. First one's coming in from Sister Diane. Diane writes references uh, regarding verse 9, the day of Gibeah, a reference to the outage committed at Gibeah in the day of the judges, the outrage. You know, I wondered about that. Not in enough time to look it up proper. But let's see. Um, let's see. Yeah, yeah, this is very, um, I forgot about this one. Let me, I'll bring this up on the screen here real quick for you, just so you kind of see. If you get a chance, go back and look at Judges chapter 19, beginning in verse 22 there. And uh, much like in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, when the angels were in the household of Lot, and the men were wanting them to be brought out before the people there, um, we see a very similar thing happened here. And the perverted men stood around the door beating on the house. And um, there was a great crime that was taking place within this instance here. And um, that is a possible reference there to what he is referring to in Hosea chapter 9. Um, there in verse, verses you know, 7, 8, 9, that area there. And Angela, one more, she asks about Ezekiel 18 verses 30 through 32. So we'll bring that up real quick. Ezekiel 18, verses uh, 30 and 30 to 32 there. 
Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, says the Lord God. Repent and turn from all your transgressions, so that iniquity will not be your, your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions which you have committed, and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. For why should you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of one who dies, says the Lord God. Therefore, turn and live. Now, that's a very good, a good question about that passage. When we read through Ezekiel, you have to remember that part of Ezekiel is definitely referring to the second, um, or the, I'm sorry, the southern nation of Judah and their second bondage. The, second, the southern nation of Judah would, because of their sin, go away into Babylonian captivity for 70 years. And so Ezekiel deals with that. And so the passage we just looked at, although he calls for repentance within Israel, he could actually be talking about Israel as in Judah itself, the southern nation there. And of course, there was a return um, that the Lord allowed to take place. And then Arthel Jr. sends the following thought in. He says, complacency is still a plague that consumes God's people. Think about Romans 12, verse 11, not slothful in business, but fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. And we must be, as God's people, fervent in serving our Heavenly Father. Yep. Alrighty, well, I appreciate the thoughts and the comments this morning. I really appreciate your attention, your willingness to join us for our Bible study here this morning. It means a lot to me to have you with us. And if you have any questions or comments, feel free to send them to us. You can send them to uh, questions at seminalpoint.church. And that's a very simple email address. Send it to questions at seminalpoint.church. And we'll do our best to get back with you if possible and try to answer the questions that you might have. If they pertain to our study, we'll try to bring it into our next study session. All righty, thank you very much. Let's go ahead and we will be dismissed. Uh, let's have a word of prayer and then a real quick brief announcement. Let's pray. Our dear Lord, most righteous and almighty Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time that we've had this morning to study your wonderful word. We pray that as your children, we will continue to learn from the lessons found within the pages of the Old Testament, the history of your people and those who both followed you and those who did not follow you. We pray that um, as your children gather together to worship you today, dear Lord, we pray that what we offer up, you'll find acceptable and pleasing in your sight. These things we pray in your son's name. Amen. I want to remind everyone that we will be meeting for services beginning at 1030 this morning. That's at 16300 North Bay Avenue, Edmond, Oklahoma. For more information, go to www.seminalpoint.church. And then, of course, we'll meet again this afternoon at 5 o'clock for worship service as well. Everyone have a wonderful day. We'll see, see you shortly.